Hey, hey, Dr. I here with the Learning Liaisons. Would you like to go through a practice set of questions on concepts you will see on your exceptional education or special education exam? Whether you're prepping for your Texas exam or your Praxis or your FTC here in Florida or any other state teacher certification exam that covers exceptional ed slash special education, you're in luck. In the following video, you're going to learn from the best from our ESC rock star specialist, Nicole Gengott, and she's going to analyze 10 practice questions for you. Before we jump into that, make sure you like, comment, subscribe to the Learning Liaison channel here because we got a ton of prep videos, how to study, how not to study, test taking strategies, and a lot of great content. In addition to our full video boot camps on our website at thelearningliaisons.com. So when you're ready to go, make sure you have something to write with and something to write on, and let's get going. All right, before we jump into your 10 questions, a couple of quick directions, very simple. Number one, I'm gonna give you 60 seconds to answer each of the 10 questions that are gonna follow. There's gonna be a timer on the screen. So use your pen, use your paper, write down your answer. And I also challenge you to write down why you chose that answer on your notes, because that's the key to passing is knowing the why. So there's going to be 60 second timer on the screen. It's going to go to the next question. And after each question, Nicole is going to break down all the answer choices for you. So we're going to go through each question, give you 60 seconds each. Then when we're done, Nicole's going to go through and analyze all those questions, and more importantly, not just the correct answers, but why it's correct and why the others are wrong. So let's get into it. You ready? Always remember, it's when you pass, not if you pass. We've got your back. Let's see how you do. To monitor progress towards a student's annual individualized education program, we also refer to this as their IEP, we're talking about the goal, the special education teacher is using a portfolio-based assessment. So a principal benefit of the using of this type of assessment will provide the teacher with what? So let's break down what the question is asking. Let's look for some of those keywords. Well, we know we're specifically talking about a student's IEP, which is going to be individualized for each student, depending on whatever their disability is, what we're gonna be identifying their strengths, but we're also going to be identifying their areas for growth. So when we're looking and talking about growth, a portfolio-based assessment is gonna be a really great tool to be able to use because portfolio-based assessments are meant to show growth over time. So when I'm looking at my answer choices, I'm going to look how this is measuring progress. And I'm also looking at the fact that it has several types of data. So this isn't just limited to special education. My son's in kindergarten and he has a portfolio, again, to show his progress and his growth throughout the time. This is going to be different from a standardized based test because that's one type of assessment where a portfolio is showing multiple pieces, especially ones that are specifically the student's work.
An elementary student with Asperger syndrome is receiving speech therapy services. The therapist is more than likely working on oral language development in which of the following areas? So again, we're gonna break down what the question is specifically asking. So in this case, they have a specific disability that we're looking at, which is Asperger syndrome, which we know is on the autism spectrum. So when we're talking about students with autism and primarily with Asperger syndrome, many of our students are going to be receiving some type of a speech therapy service. Well, what is this going to be focused on? Well, when we know that some of our students who have autism, it's not that they have a hard time with the actual words all the time, but it's what their, their intonation and what their inflection is. So how they're saying it, their tone, their pitch, could because a big goal is that we're going to wanna make sure that we're being as socially appropriate as possible. So we're going to be looking for some of those abnormal speech patterns, um, and that's gonna be reflected in, again, irregular pitch, intonation, pace, rhythm, and articulation. So when we're looking at our answer choices and we're talking specifically about that oral language development, we know that our answer is gonna be A because we're looking again for that pitch, that inflection, whereas vocabulary, different tenses, construction of sentences when we're talking about our syntax, these are going to be very different types of skills, often reflective in their writing versus this is the actual speech that they're gonna be producing. Amanda is in the evaluation process to determine if she needs special education services. The social worker on the pupil appraisal team wants to conduct an ecological assessment on her. This assessment includes which of the following? A, a classroom observation, B, IQ and academic achievement test, C, an adaptive behavior scale completed by the teacher, or D, informal interview with the parents regarding behavior, interest, and other choices like that. So let's take a look at what our correct answer is. The answer is C, an adaptive behavior scale completed by the teacher. So let's go in reverse and break down why that's what our answer is. So we're talking about the evaluation process, and this is to determine if she needs special education services. So we know that this is in the beginning of this process because we're going to determine what the services are, if she's a candidate at all, again, looking again at some of those strengths and what those weaknesses are. So when we're talking about this appraisal team and they want to conduct an ecological assessment on her, well, what's going to be the best thing for that? A classroom assessment, an achievement test, and an interview with the parents, why those are going to be inter integral parts during this entire process, it's really our adaptive behavior scale that's completed by the teacher that's going to be the assessment that really should be used in the very beginning. Because this is a collection of how the student performed in conceptual social and practical skills that are needed to function in their everyday lives. So this is talking very much about those daily life skills, whereas an IQ test, an achievement test, that's not gonna really be able to indicate that. Classroom observation, while that's important, the teacher might already have some informal assessment that she's going to be able to speak to. So that's why in this case, when we're determining if this child, Amanda, needs special education services, an adaptive behavior scale is going to be the strongest one.
of the following assessments, which is not a formal assessment. Curriculum-based monitoring, STAAR, graduate record exam, or an IQ test. Okay, when we're looking at the question, we have to focus in on not. So I know what a formal assessment is, but I wanna make sure that I'm talking about something that is not a formal assessment. So a curriculum-based monitoring is not a formal assessment. It's used by teachers to find out how students are progressing in those basic um, academic areas. The word that we're focusing on here is progress. And this is going to look like in areas of math, reading, writing, spelling. Our other assessments that are indicated in this question, these are all going to be very formalized. These are standard based types of questioning that are going to be able to be more systematically measured on how well a student is mastering a learning outcome. According to IDEIA, of the following conditions, which one would qualify a student with having a hearing impairment? A, a hearing loss of at least 100 decibels and does not benefit from a hearing aid. B, chronic ear infections that affect the student's attendance in school. C, a student with hearing loss that benefits from speech language therapy or D, hearing loss that affects academic performance. So we're talking specifically about the IDEIA, which is the individuals with disabilities Education Improvement Act. So that's going to be my first step. I have to identify what the question is actually talking about and which federal law we're focusing on. So according to the IDEIA, of the following conditions, which one would qualify a student with having a hearing impairment? And when we're talking about students in an education setting, looking for improvement that they're making, we're going to be talking about their academic performance. The type of assessment consisting of the work done by a student in class and used by a teacher to evaluate progress and adapt instruction is A, curriculum-based assessment, 
B, summative assessment, C, benchmark assessment, or D, achievement test? So this type of question is gonna be critical that you go back to the content lessons in the module and make sure that you have a clear understanding of what the different types of assessment that teachers can use are, because that's gonna help you to more correctly answer these types of questions. So we're talking about an assessment, but we're talking about assess an assessment that is done by a student in class. And then the teacher can evaluate progress and then continue by adapting instruction. So as teachers, we are constantly going to make sure that we're doing what's best for the students and making sure that we are really capitalizing on their strengths while also addressing those areas of weakness so that we can fill any of those holes and work from the foundation up while also having those high expectations and rigor. And that type of assessment is going to be happening all the time, both formally and informal when we're monitoring for our students. So our correct answer here, when we're talking about the work done with a student in class, we're talking about curriculum based. These are going to be all of our different subject areas. Whereas these three, especially our summative, that's going to be like an end of the chapter test. Benchmark to see where they are, achievement test. These are different types of tests based on curriculum base. And again, when we're thinking of curriculum, that's what the kids are learning, right? So if we're looking for something that's done by the student in class, we're talking about curriculum. A nine-year-old student in Ms. Peterson's class has been evaluated and has mild expressive language delay. She is functioning in the age-appropriate range in all other areas except hearing. So the IEP team must consider placement for the student at the ARD meeting. If no additional information is provided, which of the following placements would be most appropriate? A part-time in a resource room to maintain current skills in oral reading, B, full-time general education classes with focus on reading support, C, full-time general education classes with speech and language services, or D, self-contained special education class on concrete on academics. So we're talking about a nine-year-old, primarily a third or a fourth grader and is being evaluated. So there's some type of testing going on, which is determined a mild expressive language delay. So we're not severe. Age appropriate in all other areas, including hearing. So again, we're talking about that IEP team. And we addressed earlier that our IEP team is going to help to identify specific goals for that student. So we have to consider ARD. ARD is admission review and dismissal. ARD. So there's no other additional information. So we're trying to figure out which placement is going to be the most appropriate. We want our students to be in a gen ed setting 
as much as possible to not only have those models, but to also make sure that the expectations are high and that it's appropriate to keep the student to be moving forward. Keeping in mind that a placement isn't forever, um, but making sure that wherever that student is, that they're being the supported in the best way they can. So the correct answer is that the student should participate in full time in the gen ed classes with speech and language support services. So because there's just a mild expressive delay, then um, a speech therapist can help to fill in some of those gaps and to really support it and also link what's happening in the gen ed setting. Math achievement score of an eighth grade student with specific learning disabilities indicates that he has a stanine of eight. The most appropriate math class for him would be A, remedial math, B, practical math, C, average math, or D, advanced math. Well, in order to answer this question, we need to identify the fact that he has a stanine of eight and what exactly that means. Well, I know a stanine of nine is the highest score. So because of that, I know eight isn't too far away from that. So if our highest score is nine and this student is achieving an eight, then that's going to be an advanced math class. There's, it's not, it's above average. We're not going to need any extra supports. So eight is going to lead me to advanced. Data from a universal screening provided three times during the school year to a special education student is done predominantly for which of the following purposes? A, used by the regular education teacher to efficiently develop academic content. B, help the teacher determine which students need accommodation and special education instruction. C, to pinpoint students that are at risk and in need of behavior and academic supports. Or D, form a baseline to begin monitoring individual learner growth. So we've got a lot of words in this question. So again, we're always going to go back to breaking down what the question is actually asking, because we've all been there where we've read a whole entire page of text and have no idea what we've read. So you need to be asking yourself questions just like you would be prompting a student in the classroom. You need to be checking in with yourself to make sure that you have a clear understanding of what the question is asking, what the answer is, but also what the answer isn't. So we're talking about universal screening three times. Why? And our answer is D. It's to form a baseline to begin monitoring 
individual learner growth? So this is the correct answer. The correct answer is that universal screen of a special education student three times a year provides a baseline for progress monitoring for students' growth. We are always looking for growth, whether we're talking about our gen ed students or our special education students, or we're talking about a student who's in primary or somebody who's ready for graduation. We are always looking for some type of a baseline so that we can monitor what their growth is, what they need in order to get there, and any of the supports that would be beneficial to them. Also keeping in mind that monitoring can look different. Monitoring can be both informal and formal. And this is always going to be a team approach based on any of the specialists, on the teacher, on even the family of how a student is performing and formally could look more like a standardized assessment. Now we're talking about a little one. A six-year-old student in Miss Mueller's second grade class is having difficulty recalling the letters of the alphabet in consecutive order and is unable to make letter sound associations. After consulting with the school's multi multidisciplinary team, the student is referred for the comprehensive individual education evaluation. As the team review assessment instruments for the above situation, they should first ponder the instrument's capability to, so when we're talking about the instruments, we're talking about their tools. So let's break, break it down. A, yield data applicable to the student's educational needs. B, provide a starting point to begin assessing the progress of the student. C, adapt to the student's disability and accommodation needs. Or D, quantify the student's growth across various areas. The correct answer is A, that in determining a student qualifies for special education, the assessment would need to yield data applicable to the student's educational needs. Remember, when we are talking about our students who are receiving any type of services, it has to be unique. It has to be individualized. It has to be forever monitored and changing, and it has to be data-based, understanding that that data can look very different because um, we want to make sure that we have a full understanding of this child, their strengths and what their needs are. So the team's job is to determine if the child's disability is affecting their educational growth. And if it is, what can we do as the professionals to best help and assist this student to make sure that's not something that is stuck with them, that we can overcome it, or we can make sure that there's some type of adaptation to help them to be successful. So in this case, we're talking, yes, about a six-year-old. So it's a really good idea to make sure that when we're in the different subject areas, especially in reading and math, that you have a good understanding of where a child should be basically what is your baseline at different academic areas. So for me, my son is in kindergarten. So I know in kindergarten, he is learning his letters, the letter sounds, the order. So when we're talking about the consecutive order, but this student is unable to make letter sound associations, which is a really big skill. And in that pre-K kindergarten age is a huge year for growth because it's setting them up for success to become fluent readers and writers. So especially in the primary grades, we're building, building, building on those literacy skills. So this is definitely going to be an area that the disciplinary team is going to have to help the student with, not just to make sure that we're learning our sight words, but able to have those skills in order to generalize phonetics 
on other words. 